It set a dangerous precedent for, from now on, anyone with royal blood with a claim to the throne could overthrow an anointed king. On the 29th of September 1399, Richard II became the first English monarch to abdicate. Now, Richard II is the boy king of Peasant's Revolt fame. He first quelled and then absolutely quashed the Peasant's Revolt of 1381. The revolt had been in response to a poll tax. The uprising was against the king's councillors. The king was only 14 at the time. He'd been king since the age of 10, and so the rule of the country had been taken by a council. And so the Peasants' Revolt were looking for particular councillors who they blamed for these new rules. Richard was seen as either an innocent or just not responsible for the hardships of the people during the time. Richard was seen as a ray of hope. That is how he initially quelled the revolt and like I say you can watch this in episode 22 but effectively he um, he promised them that they would be listened to that they would get what they wanted that he was their leader he would be their their lord and sovereign and so they could look to him however he then brutally quashed the peasants or the people who had um, risen up against him, many were hung and those that survived were told that they would never be able to rise up against him again and indeed they didn't. So we saw from early on in Richard II's reign that he was very willing to quash anyone who was going to rise up against him. Now being a peasant and disagreeing with the king was one thing, being a noble and disagreeing with the king was going to turn out to be just as dangerous. Now Richard had grown up with a view that God had appointed him, anointed him, and God would protect him. His success in quelling the peasants' revolt was just further evidence to Richard that God was on his side, that he was doing God's work and God would protect him whatever he did. This seed of self-belief turned into a tyrant's belief that nobody should disagree with him. As Richard's minority came to an end, he began replacing old councillors with his new friends. Nothing surprising there, except they weren't very good at the job of leading the country. In 1386, the council had failed to adequately react to the threat of invasion from France. The old councillors saw this as the final straw. A delegation led by Richard's uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, went to Parliament for support to go to Richard and tell him that he needed to rid himself of these useless councillors. Richard's reaction was to accuse his uncle of treason. But his uncle's reaction back was, remember your great-grandfather, Edward II. That was a very thinly veiled threat, for Edward II had died in custody in Barclay Castle. Although Richard did carry out the wishes of the Duke of Gloucester and the other nobles, he secretly met with a group of judges to push a new treason law which would make disagreeing with him a crime punishable by death. This left those who wanted checks and balances on Richard's behaviour with no choice but to pit themselves against the king. Richard's cousin, the battle-experienced Henry Bolingbroke, heir to the Duchy of Lancaster, was forced to take sides. Now he had no love lost for Richard's favourites, especially a man called de Vere, and so Henry sided against the king. De Vere's forces were no match for those of Henry Bolingbroke, and the king had to admit defeat. Now the nobles had to decide what to do about Richard. Five of them met Richard at the Tower of London. They included Henry Bolingbroke, Richard's cousin, his uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, and then Arundel, Warwick, and Norfolk. For three days, they debated what to do about him, and Richard was left wondering his fate. Eventually, they decided the best course of action was to declare fealty to Richard. So this was the first chance that the nobles had had of deposing Richard, but it didn't happen this time. They instead swore fealty to him. And as Dan Jones um, writes, this is probably due to it just being the least worst option. They would have been aware that had they deposed Richard, civil war would have broken out over who should take his place. Now, all seemed to be going fine, but there's one indication that Richard was planning for the future, and that was that he was building up his own private army. 
This was not an army that required funding or approval from Parliament. This was Richard's privately funded army. So they had no loyalty to anyone except Richard. They all wore the White Hart badge. And in the Wilton Diptych, which is a altarpiece commissioned by Richard, housed in the National Gallery, you can see that the angels watching the Virgin Mary and Jesus give their blessing to Richard are also all wearing the White Hart badge. Now perhaps Richard amassing a private army was just his form of an insurance policy against something like what happened in the Tower of London happening again. But in 1394, Richard's wife, Anne of Bohemia, dies. Now she seems to be, have been some sort of quelling influence on Richard. He was distraught and his behaviour from now on just became more and more tyrannical. There is a portrait of Richard II from this time, the first portrait of a monarch to be painted from life. And it is in Westminster Abbey, near to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And he is depicted on a throne, high above everyone else. And this is actually the kind of thing that Richard started to do. He had a high throne where he could look down over everyone in the room. If his gaze was upon you, you were expected to throw yourself to the ground prostrate. In 1397, Richard reinstates the treason laws. It is now punishable by death for you to disagree with the king. It had been 10 years since the five nobles had held Richard in the Tower of London while they decided what to do with him. And now he decided to seek revenge. Warwick, Gloucester and Arundel were all arrested. Mowbray was made Gloucester's jailer and torturer. The treason trial of Warwick, Gloucester and Arundel was to take place at Westminster Hall, but Gloucester could not stand trial. Mowbray reported back to the court that he had died in custody. Not surprising for the amount of torture that he'd undergone. But luckily for Richard, he'd given a full confession before death, admitting to all of the charges that were laid against him. Henry Bolingbroke, the fifth man from the Tower of London at this point, had the choice, side with Richard or follow the fate of the others. Henry testified against Arundel and Warwick. Arundel was put to death and Warwick was banished for life. Now only Henry Bolingbroke and Mowbray remained from the original five and a paranoid fueled argument only three months later had them back in front of the king. The king said, well, I don't know which one of you is telling the truth, so I'm going to banish you both. Mowbray was banished for life, Henry for 10 years. Now all five of the leading nobles were out of Richard's way and Richard set about making sure that none of the others would be able to rise up against him again. They were forced to put their seal on blank pieces of parchment. Cunning move from Richard because he could now write on there whatever he wanted. In 1399 there are two key incidents which show Richard's overreach. The first one was the death of the Duke of Lancaster. At this point Henry Bolingbroke should have become into his inheritance. He should now be the Duke of Lancaster with all the lands and property uh, that went with that title. However, Richard claimed it for the crown. Now this undermined the right to property and inheritance in England. The second thing Richard did was he went over to Ireland to extend his influence over there. That gave Henry two perfect excuses to come back to England. Henry Bolingbroke now had nothing to lose and that makes a powerful enemy. But Richard had also created a situation where the rest of his nobles and landowners had everything to lose and they now had a leader. People flocked to Henry's cause and Richard's White Hart army was no match for them. Richard had no choice but to surrender. He was imprisoned in the Tower of London and on the 29th of September 1399 he abdicated his throne. The following day, the 30th of September, Henry Bolingbroke claimed the throne of England for himself in English, which was the first time since the Norman Conquest. Henry Bolingbroke was now Henry IV, and although following that story you can see that there was little choice really but to get rid of the tyrannical Richard II, it set a dangerous precedent for, from now on, anyone with royal blood with a claim to the throne could overthrow an anointed king. <laughs>